So one of the things there that I want to say to you today, and I'm just going to go back from a couple of weeks ago when I was sharing some things there, you are not a mistake. One of the things that Nancy had great difficulty with because she was born out of, uh, she was adopted out and born out of wedlock and so forth like that. And, and uh, for many, many years, Nancy wondered about her mother and wondered about this and wondered about that. And, and, and she felt that she was a mistake. That something, you know, just some kids. And all of a sudden, Nancy evolved. But you see, she's not a mistake. She's a child of God. You're not a loser. We, we speak a lot to ourselves. We speak to our own thinking, and, but we're not losers. We're children of God. We've got a built-in purpose. God has created something inside us. There's something built inside us. You might have remembered I spoke about a rose tree and how I bought a, a, a stick from Bunnings in a brown paper packet. And I took it home. And, and, you know, if you look at that stick, it, it just looked just miserable even. It didn't look like it had any life. At this, one of them didn't even have any shoots on it. But the color of the rose was what I liked, and so I thought I'll buy that and, and believe that it's going to be okay. And uh, so I put it in the ground, but in that stick was a rose. And... See, inside of us, we might see ourselves. We might be dry. It might be miserable. It might be all this. But inside of us is a God-given purpose. Inside of us is something there that, that God wants to produce. And you see, for that rose to be able to be produced, it had to be planted into a soil where it was nourished. And friend, it's time that we, the church, got planted in the house of God. Not necessarily this house, but in a house of God where, where we can flourish, where we can grow, where we can be watered, where we can be looked after. And then out of whatever God's put inside us will be produced. And, uh, you know, I, I stand amazed today as I, as I look at those, those roses and things like that, that that just come out of those sticks. I've got roses all over the place at the moment, and they're beautiful. But I want to just... Uh, say this to you, that whatever God's put inside you, something's got to touch it. The anointing's got to touch it. The truth has got to touch it. Something has got to touch that which is on the inside of you and me to break all the rubbish and the lies and the things that the enemy has spoken about us Something's got to come that will ignite that on the inside of you that will grow stronger than that negative force that's around us. That we can be released. And, and I believe that we have to be released in this hour that we're living in so that what God's put inside us. And so I want to break some strongholds in our mind. I want to break some wrong thinking that we get sometimes. I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of John chapter 14, and I use these scriptures uh, very, very often. Verse 12 says, most assuredly. In other words, he's saying, listen, I'm not just saying this, but I want you to really get it because I'm very, very serious about what I'm saying. I'm not just, it's not a fable. It's not some other theology or something like that. This is the truth. And if you can get it on the inside of you, it will cause you to rise up. It will cause you to overcome. It will cause you to triumph over every lie, everything that the devil has ever put into your mind, into your thinking. We've got to have something there that will break it. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. What God wants to do in our lives is He wants to create an atmosphere around our lives where we get touched by the Spirit of God, 
where the presence of God starts to uh, 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 hit something on the inside, that, that that which is in the inside begins to rise up. And all of a sudden, we come to God, and there's something about our lives. There's a character that's in our lives. There's something around our lives that, that, that begins to, uh, to, to touch God. There's honor. There's respect. It's not just a matter of walking up to God and say, God, do this. God, do that. God, do this. No, you come with honor. You come with respect. You come in, in, a, in an atmosphere of worship where you lift up your heart and, you, and, and somehow or other God sees our heart. He understands what, what, what's going on on the inside. And it's out of a heart of gratitude. It's out of a heart of what Dan was saying this morning. It's coming before him and saying, God, God, you, you saw the wickedness and the filthiness and the rubbish around my life. But God, if I was the only man on this planet, you would have said those words, I will do it for him. It's out of a heart of honor and gratitude and thanksgiving. God, that we want to see your kingdom come. And we want to see a move of your spirit across the Sunshine Coast. Not so as that we can get glorified. Not so as that we can do this. But Lord, we, are, we understand today that there are people that are being ravished by the enemy. Ravished. Horrible, horrible things that are happening. And God, you want to build your church that the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And you want to do something deep on the inside that will see a move of your spirit. Because I believe that God wants to do amazing things. Do you believe that today? If you want to read the rest of those passages, it says here in verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. See, there's something in you this morning. There's something in every one of us. There's something in that rose tree. There's something there that God wants to produce what he says he will produce. You see, we were all created, the creation. So I think it's Psalm 119 verse 1 speaks about creation, displays the glory of God. Creation there. And we were created. We were all created in six days. When God created the rose trees, He also created us. He created us with a purpose. And, the, and it says that God would, would put plants on the earth that would bring forth and, and there'd be fruit and there would everything like that. But I don't know how he, when He said He just spoke it into being. And that same creative power that you and I have no problem with we have no problem putting a seed in the ground and expecting something to grow. We have no problem putting plants uh, or, or a stick in the ground and expect a rose or an orange or a mandarin or something like that to come forth. But you see, that same power, that same creative power that created that created you. And so we've got to change the way we think because we've got more confidence in growing a tomato or a, or a, or a mandarin by the way, David, I've got mulberries. <laughs> I've been wanting to tell you that for weeks. <laughs> We've got a little thing about mulberries. <laughs> but you, can you understand what I'm saying today? And so what stops us from thinking right? What stops us from understanding that, that the Holy Spirit, he says, he will be with you and he will also be in you. He is in me. Greater is he who is in me than he that's within the world. I am more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we've got to somehow or other get a bomb inside our head to, to get rid of the wrong thinking. We don't think right. He said, these things that I do, you can do also. In Philippians 2.5, it says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now you've got to understand, he said, Hey, come on, 
I understand that my Father and I are one. I am not being here disrespectful. I'm not here, but I want to stand in my place. Jesus and I are one. The things that I do, you can do also. <laughs> and even greater things than this than you do because I go to my Father. So we've got to we've, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ. We are more than we understand. And if the devil can lie to us, well, then we will fall down. Jesus had to walk by faith. He walked by faith with honor and character, with great respect for his father. But he did not have some false humility that kept saying, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, I'll never make it. Oh, you'll have to find. No, we've got to somehow or other step up to the plate and say the blood will never lose its power. The blood can wash the foulest clean, amen. I have been cleansed, I have been washed with the blood. I am cleansed, hallelujah. I've been filled with the mighty power of God. I have the Holy Ghost on the inside of me. So do you. And that's what we've got to start to stir up. That's what we've got to start to speak. That's what we've got to start to do. Jesus lived this life on earth as the Son of, of Man. His whole life was a testimony of what faith in God can do. His whole life was a testimony of what you and I can do if he says to me today, the things that I do, you can do also. This is not just for Benny Hinn or somebody like that. This is for every person. What does it say? It says here, most assuredly, I say to you, put your name there. I say to Neil, he who believes in me, Give me a wave if you believe in Jesus today. Come on, give me a wave if you believe in Jesus. Come on, tell the truth and shame the devil. Do you believe in Jesus? Well, this is who he's talking to. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He's saying, these things that I, that I do, you can do also, and even greater things than this shall you do. So Jesus lived on this planet with a purpose and with a plan. He was trying to break strongholds of the mind. Strongholds that get inside our mind. I want you to have a look at John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Better go somewhere else first. <laughs> this, is, this is a story here of Lazarus. I don't know if you'd like to have been in that area with him. But you've got to understand the whole concept. Jesus is not just going through life, tiptoeing through the tulips with Tiny Tim. He's being harassed. They're trying to crucify him. They're trying to kill him. They're trying to stone him. They're trying to get rid of him. The magistrates, the, the religious leaders, the Jewish people, all up in arms against him. He comes to a situation here where, where uh, his friend, it says in verse 1, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus, of Bethany, a town of Mary, and her sister Martha. He gets sick, but Jesus doesn't go to him immediately. Finds out that Lazarus dies. And Jesus Starts up speaking, and, and the boys think because in verse 11 he says, uh, Our friend Lazarus sleeps. I go that I may wake him up. And this, in verse 12 it says, The disciple says, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. death. Verse 14, And Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. What he was saying here, 
I, I want an opportunity to reveal what faith in God can do. We go to meetings and we see people getting healed and, and we see miracles and what it does, it, it explodes your faith. Start seeing things. Friend, if we take the Spirit of God out, if we take the anointing out, if we take healings out, if we take all that out, what you take out is your faith. And faith begins to die. But when you start to see the Spirit of God moving and the presence of God touching people's lives, as Jesus said, I am glad for your sake. I'm glad for your sake because you're going to see something that's going to break every stronghold in your thinking. Nevertheless, let us go. Now, I want you to understand what he was speaking into. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. Let us go that we might die with him. Jesus came. I don't think there was too much faith there. As I, I believe it's as if God knows man's problems. Unbelief. Unbelief. He spent most of his time on earth demonstrating what faith in God could do. He comes up to this situation here, and, and I'm just going to add a it. Lazarus is dead. Tom, Thomas only had death on his mind. If Jesus goes to Bethany, he's as good as dead. They sought to stone you. Are you going there again? <clears throat> Let's go and die with him. Jesus continues on. He goes over, gets there to Bethany, and we know that the two girls, uh, Mary and Martha, they start saying, if you would have been here, and he goes, I am the resurrection of life. But nevertheless, what he was, this was his real purpose was to go in there and raise this man from the dead. He walks up to the situation and, and he says, roll the stone away. I, I, you know, okay, here we are. These boys really think that they're going to die. When you're in a situation like that, you really need a Thomas with you. Who's ever, ever headed off in faith doing something and all of a sudden Thomas turns up beside you and says, you know, you're not going to make it? <laughs> You know it's not going to happen or whatever it might be. And so these guys have been listening to Thomas now for a, most surely a few hours on that walk and everything like that. They're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to go. They're going to stone us. They're going to do this. This is the end, blah, blah, blah. Jesus walks up there and, and he's full of faith and full of confidence. I don't know where the boys would have been by now, but he just says, roll the stone away. Roll it away. So they roll the stone away. And, and I want to say this. There's things there that we've got to do today. We've got to start removing the blockages that are in front of us. You, you, are, you are in control of your own life. You are the, you, Jesus will speak to you, but friend, I want to tell you, you've got to start standing up and you've got to start pulling down and you've got to, instead of saying yes to some of those Thomases around your life, but you know, I found out that I don't even need Thomas. Eh? Not that Thomas. I wasn't even looking at him. I was looking at you, Miller. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need a Thomas in my life because I, I can do it myself. But you see, I also am the one that has to remove the blockages from my thinking. I got to start speaking to myself differently. I got to start up doing that. I got to listen to what Jesus says and I got to start believing what Jesus says. And Jesus there when and Martha came up and said, "You can't roll the stone away by now. He's been he's been in there 4 days. He stinks." But nevertheless the stone was rolled away and Jesus cried out to this man and commanded him to come out. And he came out bound and then he spoke to the to his disciples and he said, "You loose him." I'm very interested in this because there's quite a few stories. I'm just going to share some small stories this morning. And most of those stories, Jesus doesn't actually do the whole lot. 
He does portion of it, but then he says, now you loose him. You loose him. You set him free. And I believe it's time for the church because I believe that God's got a lot for us to do. I believe that God wants us to move. He was dead, but Jesus started to move and touch his life. In John chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus turns water into wine. I'm not going to read all the story because uh, for time's sake, but you can read the story. I think we all know it. But you see, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel were there and they filled the water pots with water. Mary said something to the boys that were very, very interesting. Because when she said, there's no wine left, Jesus said, what have I got to do with that? It's not my time. What have I got to do with that? But Mary turned around to the boys and says, whatever he says to you, do it. If ever there's a time the church needs to hear the prophetic, the presence of God, the anointing to get over your life, something that will penetrate and touch that which is on the inside of you that's already in there, just waiting to be germinated, just waiting to rise up. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I want to tell you it's got nothing to do with age. It's got everything to do with what's on the inside of you. If the Spirit of God can touch something on inside of you, the same as he did with Joshua and Caleb, Abraham, you can go on and on and on. He didn't say, how old are you? And they said, I'm this, I'm too, you're too old, I have to find somebody else. No, he's looking for a vessel, any vessel that he can touch. Moses, backside of a, of a desert, but the Holy Ghost got hold of him and touched something on the inside of him that had been there all the time. He spoke to these guys and they filled these water pots with water. The water that was in these pots, it says, was about 120 to 180 gallons. It's a big job. It's a lot of water. They didn't necessarily have attriculated water in those days. Then he said this, you draw the water. You go out and give it to the master of the feast. But Jesus, we know what we put in there. Neil, you go into all the world and preach the gospel. But Jesus, I know what's in here. I know the weakness. I know the failures. I know the things that I've done wrong. I know because the devil keeps reminding me. I know the weaknesses. I know the failures. I know, I know, I know. And you're asking me to do that? See, the boys, they said, I know what we put into the pot. It was water. And now you want me to take some of this water out of the pot and take it over to the, the master of the feast? And when he gets that water, he's, what's he going to do? You see, we can say, well, the, water, the, the wine, it turned into wine immediately, it went into the pot. We can say it went here as they took it, and it could have said as, the, as the, the master of the feast took it and it was still water, but when he put it to his lips, it became wine. I don't care when it happened. All I'm interested in is that it happened. I'm not going to have an argument with you. I don't care. But it happened, amen. But the thing is this, that he said to them, you draw out of the pot. You take it to the master of the feast. I've done my bit. <laughs> you catching what I'm saying? I've done my bit. Now you go into all the world. Now you do this. See, when we pray, we pray, God, you do this. <laughs> Jesus, you. No, he says, no, you. You take the water out. You, you take it out and you, you do it. You draw some out and take it to the master. Amazed. I believe that the disciples would have, would have been so amazed. 
See, Jesus was wanting to break mindsets, natural thinking, to a whole new way of living. How many people want to go into a whole new way of living? Jesus wants to break those mindsets, wanting to do things. You see, when, when we start to see things that happen, and I know, you know we can talk about the pineapple shed and we can talk about things there that we saw happen in the in, in that even in the the other place, the, the school building, what was that? The gatehouse. Miracles and and people were just being touched. I've told the story a lot of times about Chaz and Fran. And Chaz was there, but he just saw uh, this guy stand up the front, an uneducated guy talking about Noah. The floods and he was an educated man and and, and he, he, he was, you know, all this and that, and he was sitting back there with his arms folded saying, this idiot believes this. Until the power of God came in. Till the anointing come in. And I had a word of knowledge, and it was about five or six things, and Fran looked at, at Chaz and said, that's me. I was sitting right at the back of the hall. Somehow or other, she got up and walked up the front. The power of God hit her. She got slain in the spirit. She started yelling and screaming and carrying on. Chaz got such a shock to see his wife out the front there. She had a most likely a hundred dollar hairdo. Now looked like a she looked like the wreck of the Hesperus. <laughs> a mascara was running all over the place, and there was things that were running that shouldn't run. You have your own and, and Chaz comes out and she's on the floor. And, and she looks up at him and she says, I'm healed. Crying her eyes out, I'm healed. I'm healed. The pain's gone. I'm healed. And Chaz looked at me and I looked at him and I said, do you want, to, you want what she's got? And she said, he said, yes. And, and the both of them gave their lives to Christ. And he went home and he started working with the people, the full gospel businessmen, and praise God, you know the rest of the story. What I'm talking about, friend, is that Jesus wants to show a demonstration. And I was just as amazed as anybody else at what God could do and what God was doing. Just keep this thought in your mind. Mary said to them, whatever he says to you, do it. So I was saying with this building, if this is God, we'll have it. But if it's not, I don't want it. But if he says it, we'll go for it. We'll go for it. We'll do whatever we can. We know in Luke chapter 5, verse 1, the story of, of some fishermen. They were washing their nets. And as they're washing their nets, Jesus walks by with a great crowd of people. He says to the boys, he says, boys, can I, can I borrow your boat? And he washes out a little bit and he, and he preaches to the, to the great crowd. When he comes back from the crowd, uh, he walks up to the fishermen that had just finished putting their nets up. And he spoke to them and he said, did you catch any fish? They said, no, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. And then he spoke to them and he said to them, put down your nets for a catch. Now, I don't know where they, I'm a fisherman. And very rarely, if I put my boat in, do I fish where I put my boat in. I usually brrrr down the river, miles down the river, and you naturally go past the hundred fish. But, but obviously, it was too easy. Man, we've been up the river, we've been here, we've been everywhere, caught nothing, and by the way, what is your trade? I'm a carpenter. <laughs> well, what do you know about fish? I know nothing about carpentering, perhaps they would have said. And now you're here, we've fished all night. But can you imagine what he was trying to do was break mindsets. You can put your net down wherever I tell you and if I tell you to put your net down there, you are going to catch fish. To their amazement, I believe, it would have been as they saw the nets beginning to break. 
That's where the logic words must yield to the greater. Must work, yield to the greater. A couple of weeks ago, you might remember, I went to a conference. And I'm only going to say this for one reason, because I just want to show you something that somehow or other you've got to be able to... It's not a matter of just sitting around. We've, we've got to somehow or other get in there and do some things that will break things. Certain actions break things. We went to this conference. Wasn't many people there, but there was, it was a, I, I really liked the pastor and his wife. Didn't really know them all that well. But I got up there and I preached one night and, and, uh, and they took up an offering. And they brought the offering to me in, a, in, a, in an envelope. And they handed it to me. And I said, thank you very, very much. Appreciate that. And then I took the, the, the wife who had given me the money. I, hand, I grabbed her by the arm and I said, excuse me, I want to give this to you. She said, no, that's yours. I said, yes, it was. But now I can do whatever I like with it, can't I? She said, yeah. I said, I'm going to give it back to you. Oh. Now that sort of threw her theology a bit. And I was just really had no ulterior motives whatsoever. Then I preached another morning, and they took up another offering. And this one was bigger. I could feel it in the envelope. <laughs> and she came up and she said, now this is yours. I said, thank you. It is mine. Now it's yours. She said, no, 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 no. You, she said, the people gave it to you. I said, I know they did. And I thank them for it. But now I can do whatever I like with it. I'm going to give it back to you. And she looked at me with tears in her eyes. She said, that will help us pay the rent. That will help us pay the rent. I went home that night, and the people that we were staying with make bamboo bench tops. Beautiful. Amazing. And we were looking at this bench top and just sharing with them and looking at it and saying how nice it was. And we had a little bit. He got his lady in his office saved and looked like he sold his business now. And he just, because we prayed for it, and he sort of thanked me. And he said, Neil, he said, we want to give you a brand new bench top for your kitchen. This, is, this could be worth $2,000. I'm just saying this for a reason. On the way out, I went to see the pastor and his wife, and I said to them, I said, just want to thank you, say goodbye, keep in touch, blah, blah, blah. And she said, stop here. She said, there's something we want to give you. I said, oh, no, I've got to give it back again. <laughs> they brought me out. It's, it's that wide, that high, off the ground, it's a Broncos jersey with all the greats, or every not just the team, but every great signature on the on the thing, and blah blah blah, and blah blah blah. It's worth nothing in New, New South Wales. <laughs> But here, it is priceless. <laughs> priceless. And I said to, the, said to them, oh, I might get a bit emotional. I said, please, I can't, cannot accept this. I cannot accept this. She said, Neil, last night, somebody came and gave us $10,000. Can you catch my drift here? I'm not just saying give money, but I'm saying you've got to do some things to break things. I had no idea the blessing that was going to come my way. They mostly had no blessing that there was $10,000. The kids had no idea that there was a $500 or whatever dollars that somebody was in two rows in front of them. 
that somewhere along the line they've sown, somewhere along they've done something, that when, when trouble comes, God's there for you. Amen. Let's pray that you catch what I'm saying. I'm going to have a, a showing. <laughs> Oh, I've, got to, I've said enough, the kids are back in, so it looks like we've got to quit. I, I, I just, just want to be so humble and, and not being silly, but just in acknowledging how good God is, how amazing God is. And see, we can just keep walking like this and nothing much changes. But then there's somewhere along the line where we've got to perhaps do a, a little bit of a shift to, to, to break some things over our lives. You know what I'm talking about? To be able to enter into everything that God has for us. The people, they're building this thing for me now. When I get that, we'll have a showing. <laughs> But it's, it's amazing. Just letting God be God. Amen. And uh, I believe that God wants to shock us in what he can do. Amen. If you've got a needs here this morning, if there's got a need, just say, to ask God, God, what have I got to do to break it? I know, I know I've been in churches where they want money. And please, I don't want money. I don't want money. I'm not talking about money. But they say, you know, really, if you want to break through money, you've got to give money. Sometimes it's not money that you've got to give that will give you a breakthrough in finance. It's something totally different. It's not got, I'm not here looking for money. What I'm here is looking for people to be released. That's my heart, okay? I'm not doing this. We're not having a... Uh, oh, by the way, we're going to have an offering right now. <laughs> no, there's no offering, nothing. But I want you to make an offering of yourself to him. Amen? So I don't know what he wants to do. And really, I'm not making an altar call this morning. This is the only morning I've never made an altar call for people to come out the front. I'm making an altar call for people sitting in the seat. I want all standing. Let's all stand to our feet. Why don't you just ask Jesus, what? Show me, Lord, that so I can break through, so I can break free. Show me, Lord, to, what I can do to help germinate that which you've got inside of me, the giftings. the giftings that I can be used not abused but that you'll use this vessel that you'll touch it cause life to flow in it life and Father we just give you all the praise we give you all the glory we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus name and if we could sing that Second last song you sang. What is it? I need you more. I often, when we sing this song, I need you more, I hear God <laughs> answering me back and saying, yes, and I need you more. We say, I need you more. He says, yeah, okay, but I need you more. I need more of you. I wonder if in our minds and our thinking we could say, God, I just want to surrender my life to you again. I want to surrender myself to you, Lord. And whatever you say to me today, I will do it. Lord, would you speak to me? Lord, would you speak to me? Lord, would you activate, touch me on the inside, Lord, that, that I might burst, burst into like a rose tree, like that stick bursts into a, a fragrant rose Lord that this vessel might burst into something so beautiful Lord 
that people will be able to come around it and, and be touched and be blessed. People will find you through it. God, I, I don't want to just sit on the shelf. God, help me. Would you touch that in me today, Lord? Would you breathe on it again, Lord? Would, it, would you help it to burst into life again, Lord? God, would you help me to burst into life? Would you show me that all that you want me to do, my God? Help us, Jesus. I need you more. More than yesterday, I need you more. More than words can say, I need you more. Than ever before, I need you more. I need you.